So I'm happy to be here representing the Indiana Barn Foundation. Um, my background prior to my involvement with the, that nonprofit volunteer organization is that uh, I was a, I'm trained as a historic preservationist. Uh, I was a contractor, restoration contractor for many years. I actually started my carpentry work in barns. So I, uh, as a pretty young man, learned um, how to work on barns and worked on several barns over a number of years, including dismantling and moving some. Um, I never was enticed to scrap any, uh, but uh, I did work for some people who were in that business at one time. Uh, and then I, as my career went on in preservation, I got a master's degree from Columbia University, and then I started a company called Preservation Development, which uh, basically specialized in historic tax credit work for uh, people who were redeveloping historic buildings uh, in Indiana. I've had a long affiliation with Indiana Landmarks, uh, and um, my last job was this directing the Historic Preservation Program at Ball State's College of Architecture. So I have a broad preservation background, but my true love is what I've returned to, which is uh, historic barns. We organized the Indiana Barn Foundation in 2013. This is our 10th anniversary, and uh, one of my tasks is, uh, for that organization is to travel all over the state and inspect and evaluate the condition of historic barns for their owners and help them understand ways in which they can restore them uh, and keep them standing and, and protect them. Uh, whether they're going to put them back into use as this particular building was done or keep them as agricultural buildings, um, our mission is to protect Indiana historic barns. To that end, we speak to a lot of people about the history of barns, and uh, because we understand that uh, the more you know about them and the more you appreciate them, the more likely you are to protect them or to tell your neighbor to protect them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is give you a, a sense of the history of barns and, and talk about three primary styles that we find in the Midwest, particularly in Indiana. They're, they're common across the United States until you get to St. Louis, roughly, um, and they represent the, early, the earliest settlement patterns of um, our colonial period. Uh, so the earliest people who come to this continent uh, bring with them uh, their cultural understanding and, of course, their trade. And for most of them, um, their trade was agriculture. So they brought their barns as well as their houses and their skills in, in producing those buildings with them. And so in any particular settlement area, uh, let's take southeastern Pennsylvania as an example, you get immigrant Germans primarily and Swiss and Germans from what was at one time the Holy Roman Empire, which is a considerable part of Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and they brought with them uh, the Pennsylvania Bar, or the Pennsylvania Dutch Bar. And those people migrated from the East Coast uh, in, in a couple of different patterns, but one of the main patterns that they took was across uh, Lower New York State, Upper Ohio, and Northern Indiana. The reason that we have Pennsylvania barns in Indiana, in particularly in this, this, this geography, is because of that immigrant passage. So several generations of people brought their cultural baggage, if you will, their know-how to this country and passed it along to their relatives. And we're still seeing people modeling English barns, Dutch barns, uh, Pennsylvania barns, which is just a sign, perhaps, of how deep those cultures reach. So even though we use these barns for different purposes, several generations built, for instance, English barns and just expanded them into their own agricultural experience. Um, so building great-granddad or great-great-great-granddad's barn was a common 
uh, feature of our landscape. And it, <coughs> excuse me. And after we're done with this, I'll, we're going to walk up to a very nice, fairly early English barn model um, to get a picture of sort of what they look like in in their natural state before they've been uh, completely remodeled like this one. So this immigrant passage, if you look on the right, the, the material folk culture regions show several migration routes from the East Coast into the Midwest. That northern one that goes across right through what is Fort Wayne, just south of South Bend, brought the Pennsylvania barn to this part of the country. The migration route that goes through southern Indiana brought the English barn. And the one that goes through the very deep south, through Pennsylvania and Virginia, and back up into the Midwest, also brought English traditions. Um, so if you cross, as you go from southern Indiana into northern Indiana, you cross these cultural patterns, and you find different kinds of barns that were brought by uh, the ancestors of the people, the settlement uh, families who first came to this country. The, the map on the left, uh, is another folklore map which shows how ideas moved through the country, um, somewhat more complex. So the first barns uh, in in the settlement period are are known in the in the language in the barn lingo as crib barns. So a crib is a room. Okay. So um, it doesn't have to be log but almost all of them were log. It doesn't have to be squared and hewn logs, but most of them that were built for permanence were, although some were built for round logs. This particular uh, structure, you see the slat furring strips on the, on the side of it. That was intended to carry clapboard siding. So a lot of these early crib barns were actually sided with clapboard siding, horizontal clapboard siding, in order to protect the logs. And so you may drive through the countryside of South Carolina and see these barns right going right down the street and think that they're houses, okay? So we, in our wisdom, have uncovered these barns because we love to expose the logs. Um, if you've ever been to Nashville, Indiana, you've seen lots of log cabins that were originally clad with clabbered. Um, unfortunately, it's not very good for the logs to leave them exposed to the weather. But, but anyway, the crib barn is rare now. Mostly you see them in southern Indiana. And they, they morph into several different styles and shapes. But they basically are built from adding one crib to another crib to another crib to make a single room barn into a multi room barn. If you look in this barn, these structures that go from side to side, this timber structure is known, it's known as a bent. Okay. And these bents are assembled one after the other, stood upright in order to tie the entire barn together. Each space between the bents is called a bay or a crib. Okay, so it's it's derived from the single room barn. I'm standing in one room, you're sitting in another room, and the people in the back are sitting in another room. So if you read about barns, you'll see nomenclature referring to cribs. They don't just mean single crib barns, they're referring to cribs or stalls or spaces for storage rooms. In housing, they're called pens, which is confusing because we think we keep animals in pens uh, and, and babies in cribs. So it's confusing. This is a farmstead in southern Indiana. It is completely intact from, from when it was originally built and, and formed. These are rare. It's, it's very uncommon to see the entire farmstead intact like this. The main home, which is on the right, and then several different functional barns raised for different purposes, but, but to uh, represent and, and enable a very diverse uh, multifactional farming which was essentially subsistence farming, okay? Uh, it's very unusual to come across an entire site like this. It's more usual 
if you see a barn at all, to see one house, uh, that doesn't mean that's how that place operated. It means that all the rest of the buildings have probably uh, been taken down. This is a good example of a barn. I'm sorry that it's a terrible slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. This crib on the right and the left is inside the barn that I just showed you. So it's common to see entire barns built around early cribs. As the farm expanded, farmers' families grow, their practice develops, uh, machinery develops, farm agriculture changes. They take the original crib buildings and they just expand them into other barns. You know, some of the handwork that you see in these barns. Um, hand hewn timbers, same as you see here, formed by hand with a broad axe, and then hand carved hinges on this this plank door, just about everything put together uh, with uh, an axe, uh, chisels, and hammers, almost all handwork, which is common in the crib barn, less common in later barns. I'm sorry you can't see this. This is a double crib barn with an aisle in between. So it's two rooms uh, built separately and then joined by a single roof with an aisle left in between. <coughs> Now, if you can imagine this barn growing to four cribs, um, now you have a basic, basically a square barn with an aisle that goes through left, uh, north, south, and another aisle, a cross aisle that goes east, west, and you have, you have crossed aisles in the middle of four rooms. That barn evolves into several other styles. Here's an example of a very large timber frame barn built in late 19th century around a crib barn. So this farmer had this crib barn originally on their property, whether his ancestors built it or not, we don't know. Um, but why waste it? They just made it into another usable room inside a much larger hay barn. And it's still in use. So this is an example, uh, I'm gonna show you several examples of an English threshing barn. The English threshing barn evolves from the English-speaking settler, Scotch, Irish, Welsh, English. Um, they bring this barn, and they're, of course, they're primary settlers uh, in what becomes the United States. They bring the English threshing barn here in the settlement period. And the very earliest ones are known as three bay threshing barns. That means that there are three, there are four bends and three bays between them. Um, they always have doors on the long side and they have doors like this barn does on the long side and also immediately on the opposite side. The purpose of that was to drive your wagon in, drop your loose wheat on the floor, on a wooden floor, thresh it by hand, open the doors and blow out the chaff, okay? So the breeze that I'm feeling right here in this much larger English barn example, uh, was used as early as 1500 in Scotland to blow the chaff off the threshing process. This barn is still being built. And there are many examples, and the one we're going to see a little later up on the hill is an English threshing barn as well. The telltale is always that it's one story, has a gable roof, uh, and doors on the long side. Here's a slightly elaborated one from a generation or two later. And here's one with double threshing doors. And this is an example of the barn that we're in today. This barn had double threshing doors. Uh, it's obviously an elaboration over the earliest form. And here's the one that we're in today, all cribbed up and ready to renovate. So this barn was raised up put on cribs, cribs are the, are the uh, multi-faced uh, log structures underneath that, that hold it up. And then uh, the foundation was replaced. And if you've been downstairs, you've seen the beautiful lower structure of, of this building. Uh, we're really one of the finest ones I've, I've seen 
particularly the lower story, which is obviously built for a great deal, holding a lot of weight. Yeah. It had a foundation under it. But the, 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 main, the main post dropped down through the floor about four or five feet, um, but, the, but the cellar has been deepened to, to create an entire floor. Yeah. I'll talk a little bit more about it and try to use it as an example as we go along. As barns progress, the English barn form is retained windows are added and on this end is a large hay door a hay hood which is that small projection that comes off and you start to see this shape uh, as early as the 1860s or 1870s the reason that it, the wall is attenuated or taller like that is because now it's a hay barn so the original threshing barn didn't have a loft in it and wasn't really used for hay storage it was used to, to store grain where they threshed the wheat, they built these tight bins to keep out vermin, and they stored their, uh, their grain in, the, in them. Uh, occasionally they were used to have, you might stall one horse or one cow, but they were small subsistence barns, um, not, not large general purpose barns. What, what explains this is as, as agriculture slowly becomes more and more commercial, and the subsistence family starts to sell their products in, in a marketplace, they begin to take on more and more animals that they can raise to sell, and they begin to grow more and more crops, particularly hay, because they have to feed the animals that they're gonna put in the commercial market. When they're subsistence families, they don't really have to grow very much hay. They're just feeding a cow or two, and they put them to pasture. They don't worry about having winter feed, which is what hay is. But once the farms commercialized, which starts to happen in a big way after the Civil War, um, they get taller and they get longer and they, and they get bigger and more multi-purpose. But the general conception of them, the, ar the architecture of them doesn't really change. The, the door, the threshing door is still on the same side. There's always an opposite door. And the cultural milieu, if you will, just continues. Shortly, by about 1870, we start to see the gambrel roof, okay? That's a two-pitch roof instead of a single-pitch roof. The, the single reason for this is to store more hay than you can store under a gable roof. We call these Dutch roofs because there are examples in Dutch colonial architecture uh, of this shape of roof as early, as early as the settlement period. There are very few examples of it in Holland. It's actually, uh, there's an argument about its derivation among folklorists, but it's, it's first seen in, in the German, Germanic countries, not, uh, which you can argue Holland was. So here again, the door on the long side, and now we have a little peak, uh, ventilation peak over the door, uh, which is associated um, uh, with, with a particular kind of architecture that, that becomes popular uh, in the early 19th century. This is probably a 19th century, or I'm sorry, early 20th century. This is probably a, a 20th century barn. The little roof over the door that protects it from weather and allows the farmer to keep, leave the door open and keep the rain out is called a pent roof. And you see that more and more often too. And it's taken from the Pennsylvania barn. So remember as we all moved west, we made neighbors of people who came from different cultures. And they brought their barns and we brought our barns and we're talking over the fence. They go, hey, I kind of like that little roof you've got over the door of your barn. I think I'll put one of those on mine. So the barn becomes more and more complex, a piece of architecture and, and a multicultural representation of agricultural practice as time moves on. Now here's a you know, pretty common sight uh, in the American agricultural landscape here full gambrel roof hay barn built in the English barn style. It's, this is a very, very common barn. Um, it has a raised basement foundation, which allows, it, allows them to have animals uh, and manure in the, in the lower story without rotting the beams away. They have stone, stone or masonry foundations. 
They usually have side sheds on them that were used um, primarily for machinery. So as, machine, as mechanization progresses uh, and, and you have machinery that you have to protect, first it's horse-drawn machinery, and then of course gasoline-driven tractors and so on will come along later. So those side sheds are basically um, equivalent to the garage that happens with housing. You don't have garages until you have cars, right? So another style of barn, the transverse frame barn, sometimes called the transverse crib barn if it's built out of log cribs, is a barn that has its entry on the end and the aisle goes down the middle from, from one end to the other. The brilliance of this development comes from adding cribs onto one another and putting a longer roof over them and creating that cross aisle that I was talking about. At some point, they close off one of, the, one of the aisles and they have a single aisle that goes all the way down the middle of the barn and they continue to add cribs to the, to the end of the barn, which makes sense because as the farm grows, it's much easier to just add rooms to the end. If you have an English barn and you add, door, and you add rooms to the side, now you don't have the cross aisle that you need. So this transverse barn sort of takes over, particularly in the Midwest where agriculture is king, right? So you start to see these barns. Um, they develop out of, a, out of crib frames in, in the 1790s to 1810 in eastern Tennessee. So it's just right here with our neighbors, right? This is actually developed in the Midwest. It's a true American form, unlike the English barn. And I'll show you several variations of it. So this is the a representation, it's, a, it's speculation, I'll have to say that, but most folklorists and architect, architectural historians believe that this is the origin of the crib barn, of the transverse barn. So, I'm not sure my wires are gonna let me get close, but uh, you see a single crib at the top, and then a crib with a drive-by shed on one side next to it, and as you come down, you see an aisle between two rooms, and then you see the four cribs that I was talking about with the cross aisle. And then they add two more, close off the cross aisle, and now you've got three cribs on either side of a single aisle, and that is the transverse barn. That's, that's, the, that's the speculative uh, uh, evolution of that form. Most, most folklorists and architectural historians agree that that's probably what happened. There are several variations of it. Uh, two, two aisles, two side aisles, a cross aisle on the front, in the Appalachian barn, and so on. Those are all variations that develop from the transverse barn as farmers see different ways of using the form. Here's a good example of one with the gabled roof. If you see cupolas on the top, they're, they're, they have two purposes. One is they're a representation of civility. If you have a, if you have a cupola uh, on the top of your barn, you're you're contributing to the civic wherewithal. It's like the cupola on the courthouse, right? Uh, and it may serve no other purpose. If it has vented windows in it, it's part of the ventilation system of the, of the barn. There's a point at which, in about 1870, a movement starts called the Scientific Agricultural Movement. It's part of the, pro the progressive movement, which is a, basically a health and welfare movement um, where people are recognizing the meaning, the, the significance of germs, of germ treatment, of sanitation, all these things. Well, it, it happens in agriculture just like it happens in, in civil life. So uh, you have to take care of animals. You, the people learn from the new sciences that uh, manure in a barn that is not ventilated is not a good thing. People get sick, but animals also get sick. So ventilation becomes a key attribute of, of the 20th century barn in particular. That's what these windows are about, and that's what that cupola is about. There's a great example. <clears throat> uh, bent roof on the end. As these barns get bigger, the transverse doors in this end are the primary doors, the biggest doors. The largest equipment can go in there. But notice that they've also added side doors like you see in the English barn. Why not, right? You, you need access to that part of the barn as well. 
So as barns get bigger, these forms start to coalesce into, into new forms. Um, they're still longer than they are wide, and the transverse aisle is the primary aisle. Another example. When you see the, um, uh, this barn's very attenuated, very tall, which means that, it, but that it, a lot of hay, uh, the, the loft probably starts right above the white door band that you see there. So this, this farmer is putting up a lot of hay. The shed on the right, sometimes called a portal shed, because it offers another door and, a, and an aisle that goes all the way down the side of the barn. These are frequently used originally for wagons, so you could drive the wagon all the way through with your team and not have to back out, and then eventually are used for tractors and other equipment that you, you don't want to have to turn it around inside the barn. This evolves into what is what becomes, uh, well, here's another example of a very large gambrel roofed hay barn. Uh, and this evolves, that, the one I just showed you, evolves into a barn that has a shed on either side of a central transfers aisle and that evolves into what's called the three portal Midwestern barn this is the most common barn in the United States west of st. Louis this is this is the predominant barn you, you hardly ever see anything that isn't a 